So the preface from Rastam P. Masani was written in Bombay. During the last few years, I was often asked by publishing houses to write a book on the creed of Zoroaster. I could not, however, make up my mind to essay the task, partially owing to other engagements and partially owing to diffidence concerning my capacity to do justice to the theme. At last, the necessary impulse came as a result of an invitation I received a few months ago from my esteemed friend, Reverend John Mackenzie, then Vice Chancellor of Bombay University, to give a short talk on the subject to a group of Christian students of religion. At the gathering of that distinguished group of earnest seekers after truth, I realized more vividly than ever before the keenness on the part of the Christians, generally, to have some knowledge of the ancient religion which was preached about 3,000 years ago to the vast population of a once mighty empire by the sage of Iran, the forerunner of those wise men of the East who came and bowed before the majesty of the newborn light of the world, a religion which bent fair at one time to be the creed of almost the whole civilized world and which, despite the loss of that empire and vicissitudes of centuries, is faithfully followed to this day by a handful of descendants of the ancient Iran Iranians. Um, well, faithfully followed in what, they've been, what has been passed to them, not necessarily um, a pure transmission, or why would there be any further exemplar prophets? For these survivors, the modern Parsis, scattered all over the world, the voice of the great master is still <coughs> the voice of the great master is still a living voice. The echo of his clarion call to rally to the standard of the spirit of goodness and to rout the forces of the spirit of evil is heard till this day in their homes and places of worship. Zarathustra's outlook on life was one symbolic of the essential unity of the universe. In his system, the entire creation forges its way towards the goal of purification, and it is man's mission in this world to contribute towards the attainment of that goal. For the fulfillment of this glorious mission, he must set his feet on the path that leads mankind to the destined goal, the path of Asha, or righteousness. All other paths are no paths. Of Mazda, the all-wise Lord, is the fountainhead of the good mind. The good mind is the basis of all good thoughts, from which originate all right speaking and right doing. On these three pillars, pure thought, pure words, and pure deeds, the prophet of Iran reared the stately edifice of his ethical code, which influenced the life of the ancient Iranians for centuries, which is seen reflected, though dimly, in the conduct and character of their descendants. The creed of Zarathustra may therefore be aptly described as the religion of the good life. It's it is eminently the religion in which good deeds are held up as the best and most acceptable offering to God. Religious merit consists, according to the teachings of the Master, not in austerities, not in sacrifices, in the offerings to the powers of evil, not in the cultivation of fugitive and cloistered virtue, but in daily exercise, but in the daily exercise of positive virtue and the diffusion of good deeds. Notice how sometimes I repeat things to make sure they're clearly said, and at some point, you know, I, I want to make my stuff something that can just be edited at some point instead of something that has to be um, redone, if that's ever to be done. 
but as is my channel is you know showing the real side of uh, preaching and teaching and practicing and that sort of thing. Um, the pivotal problem of life is the problem of evil. On its solution hinges the destiny of mankind. The physical world which man inhabits is full of evil. There goes on within the heart of man a ceaseless conflict between the animal and the human, the diabolic and the divine. His life is consequently steeped in sorrow and suffering, yet it is a life worth living. The holy prophet, whose own life was an inspiring example of earnest ethical endeavor, calls upon his followers to accept the challenge of the principle of evil and to enlist themselves as comrades in arms with the author of goodness. This call to arms is accompanied by the cheering and inspiring message that if man but does his duty, good will prevail at last, not by mere negation of evil, not by retreat before it, but by facing it boldly and fighting it with all one's might. May man hope to fulfill his lofty destiny to redeem the world from evil and to establish the kingdom of righteousness on this earth. He was but animal yesterday. He is man today. His destiny to be angel, or Gichdi Malik, or, you know, uh, you know, unity with the angels, but not, you know, definitely you don't become a light being. Humans are humans. They can be greater. Uh, definitely the prophets were greater beings than the light beings, because they could have chosen wrong, but look at what they've done. If not all at once, in the not distant hereafter, as a result of a gradual process of self-purification, the struggle within man's heart is merely a counterpart of the struggle with which he encounters in the outer world. To eliminate disease and to make the world more habitable for his physical existence, he has to fight and harness the elements. Similarly, he has to wage a struggle against the forces of ignorance, superstition, credulity, and bigotry for the emancipation of his reasoning faculty and for his intellectual progress. For his social advancement, he has to combat social wrongs and social injustice. And for his moral ascent, he has to wage the greatest struggle of all struggles, incessant war against his lower self. Jihad al-Akbar is the lifelong black alchemy. The world is thus a battlefield, and man, the ally of the beneficent spirit in combating evil in all its manifestations. What is demanded of his followers by the prophet of Iran is viral cooperation with the spirit of good and fighting the forces of evil. It is not enough that he should ignore or non-cooperate with evil. He should abhor it wholeheartedly and fight it vigorously. Resist evil is the Zoroastrian battle cry. In this Essentially militant aspect, the Zoroastrian concept of the good life differs from the ideals put forward by other seers who taught man to ignore evil or to meet it with passive suffering. They laid particular emphasis on the subjective real the Yeah, you definitely can't ignore things if you just, you know, you gotta deal with it. Um They laid particular emphasis on the subjective realization of the good through a stoical suppression of desire and the attainment of perfect tranquility of mind. Well, sublimation instead of suppression is a better idea. 
indifference to all causes of joy and sorrow, and resignation to all evil and suffering are the natural corollary. Zarathustra, on the contrary, stirs the hearts of the followers. The positive hatred of evil spurs them to join the struggle against the spirit of evil and exhorts them not to evade the fight or turn their backs on the arch enemy. Goyim means those who turn their backs. You know, different language. <laughs> In his creed, there is no suggestion that the best defenses against evil spirits is to direct towards them the strength of benevolence. You know, the Christian demon altars with their I can convert, once I summon up these demons, I can convert them to Christianity because I'm such a good Christian. Okay, you can think that, but I wouldn't recommend trying that. Nor is there any suggestion for the propitiation of the powers of evil or of any compromise with them. Asceticism is unknown. Renunciation, monastic life, celibacy, uh, mendicancy, Fast, mortifications of the, of the flesh have no place in his philosophy of life. Actually, it is said that a fast once every three days was considered the ideal, but it's not a self-mortification fast. It's a, I can control myself completely from some things every three days, and therefore I can keep myself from the unlawful of such things. Um, let's see. Penance, no doubt, is enjoined, but only as a penalty for sins committed by thought, word, and deed. Such is the moral groundwork of the Iranian religion, not merely to be good and to eschew evil, but to do good and resist evil is its basic principle. This is the supreme contribution of Zarathustra to religious thought and practice. His message of moral duty and hope implies constant application of the cardinal doctrines of that religion to the problems of daily life. Constant endeavor to conquer evil builds character. During the incessant struggle against the forces of evil are developed traits of character such as strenuous effort, industry, courage, justice, truthfulness, self-improvement, and self-sacrifice. To cultivate these qualities is therefore a duty enjoined by the prophet on all his followers, and no religious ideal or injunction can invest life with greater dignity or help a man in getting near God more than this battle cry to resist evil and to fortify oneself with an armor knit with those virtues which are essential to secure the salvation not only of one's own self, but of mankind generally. Some of the sterling qualities of the Parsi community which strike the other communities most are its vitality, which has enabled it to withstand the vicissitudes of centuries, its, ad its adaptability to change circumstances, its loyalty to the crown, its industry and spirit of citizenship, and above all, its philanthropy. To what extent those qualities are induced or simulated by the religion which the community professes is a question frequently asked, but no attempt is made to answer this question. In the following pages, the reader will be able to draw his or her own inferences from the bare statement of the fundamental principles of this religion and its code of ethics. And I want people to do that with my page. I want people to look at the material that I have here and elsewhere to draw their own to get their own knowledge, to develop their own understanding, to have their own experience, regardless of their personal choices of belief or and actions, my hope is to encourage from those things. If conscious 
enjoying strict adherence to the principles and precepts embodied in one's prayers, if one lives or even strives earnestly to live up to these principles, one's conduct must necessarily be on a high level. The Parsis are devotional people. Prayer forms the daily routine of their lives. Dr. Moulton vividly calls attention to this aspect of Zoroastrianism in the following words. Okay, maybe I should share that book in more detail in the further year. Um, and in a prayer for prosperity of all kinds to come on the worshiper's house, we read in this house, obedience, vanquish disobedience, peace, smite unpeace, bounty, vanquish niggard temper, you know, stingy temper, piety, impious rebellion, word true spoken, word false spoken, Asha smite druge forever. It is a comprehensive benediction. He who offers it has only to live up to it, and he will live thereby. Who's the author uh, of the book called Dem Demogorgon? Um, something, it's like a 60 page, uh, well, there's, there's a book by him, Maldiction, a 60 page, you know, opposite of that, just you know, um, it's what some people would say. Uh, most people would probably say it's the most disturbing thing they've ever read. Um, in presenting this book to the reader, I lay no claim to originality or research. I have drawn freely on existing works on the subject, particularly on the splendid contributions made to the store of Zoroastrian lore by the late Sir Javanji Modi a name ever to be remembered in connection with Iranian studies with reverence and affection, and by Dr. Dashtur M. N. Dalla. The book is intended primarily as a handbook for non-Zoroastrians. In part one, an attempt has been made to state and elucidate as briefly as possible the fundamental doctrines of the great religion, laying specific emphasis on its ethical aspect. In part two is given brief account, a brief account of Zoroastrian rites and ceremonies. This is mainly an abridgment of Javanji Modi's excellent thesis on the subject, the religious ceremonies and customs of the Parsis. I've read that book, um, Avesta.org um, is an interesting site that I make sure to read everything that goes on that site. Um, and everything about Zoroastrianism that I can get my hands on. Um, my grateful acknowledgments are due to all the scholars whose works I have consulted and whose authority is quoted at the proper places. I desire also to thank Reverend Dr. John Mackenzie for his valued forward. What indeed could be more fitting than that one who incidentally suggested the composition of this thesis and who can speak with knowledge and authority not only as a Christian minister, but also as a cultured scholar and public-spirited citizen held in high esteem by the followers of all faiths in the cosmopolitan city of Bombay, should introduce this book to the general reader. My thanks also due to my kind friends, Mestres B. N. The bar at May, and B T. And Clasaria M A, for going through the manuscript and favoring me with helpful criticisms and suggestions. Um, what I know, I don't know if he'd be universally respected. Um, well, those who want to be cosmopolitan, more likely. But okay, so. At the foundation of things is the belief, the faith, the knowledge, um, our disbelief in certain things. Um, and then we got to look at what is meant in terms of a prophet. We got to turn away from what is not a god and, you know, figure all that out. And then it's, then let's look at what is a god. Let's look at the universe, spiritual and otherwise. 
go into the archangels, you know, the, the great light beings, the lesser light beings, understand the layout of the temple and the material culture, the um, going in further to how the spiritual and physical things coincide with each other. Um, good and evil, what is that? What's going to happen at the end times? What's going to happen after that? What are ethics overall, and what is meant by worship? And by worship, of course, I think that no real prophet of God would have came with, you know, here's a team of priests. I want to make the ritual so complex that the people can't do it. It's like, uh, do the, uh, you know, if it's required of us, you think we'd have the ability, not just, you know, people who were basically secluded and deprived of television and all that. And while that, that's certainly important, you know, we've come across how much Christians knew about other faiths back in the day. And it's like uh, your average street preacher doesn't even know their Christianity all that well, let alone the, the other ones. Um, Jesus died for your sins, but well, what are the sins? Um, what are various other things? Uh, they don't know the difference between their... But okay, so belief. What good is ritual? Even if it's just basic stuff that everybody can do um, throughout life, what good is that without the beliefs behind it? We can have certain effects. I see people who don't believe things, who don't understand things and go through it, and they have some effect. But it's, trust me, it's greater if you know about some of these things. But symbolism is, is, is far more open than people would say. So there's social things, birth, marriage, funerals, you know, what to do after the funeral, um, purifications from the various keep-away-froms in life, you know, bleeding and sex and all that, and, and the dirtiness, uh, you know, going to the bathroom and maybe things that aren't, don't make you ritually impure, but, you know, cleanliness, um, initiations, various stages in life, obviously the greater ones would, some are automatic, by nature and, you know, you growing up in the community, and it's like, well, it's, the guy's already a member. Some are not so automatic. How do we designate a sacred place? This place was cleaned out of basically being a trash heap. Um, well, not a trash heap. There was some stuff of value stored in here, but a lot was thrown out. Um, carpet shampooing, all sorts of stuff. And I, I intended to have more of the room than just this corner for the general public, but, um, you know, the carpet keeps on getting dark from in the one corner, so I've kind of given up that for the most part. But uh, we performed a ritual prayer, two of us did, on the last Friday um, before the ninth month two years ago. And, well, okay, I, I, that's... And then there's stuff based solely on scripture. Um, and there's certainly healing aspects that people can look to about their rituals. Healing. Spiritual healing. And just general practice of remembrance. Of all issues, a, a scripture... You think a God would reveal a scripture that can be used to address all issues of life. Doesn't necessarily... Well, what rocket fuel and... Uh, leave those foolish questions. I mean, right and wrong, how to put spiritual context in different things, and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh,